Okay. So yeah, we're very excited to having Dr. Uh, Victoria Bry uh, present on uh, surface guided radiation therapy. So without any further ado, Dr. Bry. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, are you able to see my presenter screen or? Uh, no, we see, see we see exactly what we should see. Okay, great. All right. Again, I'm Victoria Bry, and I am a medical physics resident at the University of Washington. And today I'm gonna to talk about surface guided radiotherapy. Today I'm going to um, talk about how the system works, specifically the triangulation technique that um, it uses. We're gonna talk about the available systems such as the CRAD, Vision RT, and Varian systems. And then I'm going to get into the workflow of using surface imaging with positioning and motion management, uh, and mention as well a couple of case studies. Okay. I was trying to turn on my video, but. That is off, okay. All right, so let's get dive in. So to start, what is surface imaging? It is a non-ionizing technique that uses a projector and a camera to determine the depth of an object. So surface imaging takes an image a step further than we're used to. Uh, if you look at this image on the slide on the left, that's kind of the typical, 2D image that you know a lot of us take with our phones these days. The surface imaging goes a step further and tells us more about the depth of an object. Object. It can give us a topographic map or a motion map of the patient surface. And so the triangulation technique is most commonly discussed uh, when explaining how the system works. So first we start with an object. In this example, we have hands. Hands are then illuminated with light patterns from a projector and reflected light is read by a camera. And in this specific example, this is structured light. So this is how one of uh, the vendor systems does um, reconstructs or are similar, the structure light is how one of the vendors um, uses a triangulation technique. So after light is projected onto the object and reflected back to the cameras, there's a software that is able to reconstruct a 3D live image of this object, uh, which looks similar to um, this bottom right image. So what does that mean for radiotherapy? So in radiotherapy, we want our patients to be in a specific position because we plan a whole treatment based on that one position. So the goal in radiation therapy is to have a reference image of our patient in treatment position. And then we can compare that to a live image um, of our patient on the treatment table. There is a registration that occurs by the system that overlays that reference image to a live image. And as those images are overlaid, the system provides shift discrepancies. And we can use this for setting up a patient for treatment um, and as well as for real-time position tracking throughout the duration of their treatment. And I'm not gonna talk much about this new task group, but I did wanna mention that there is a new AAPM task group that was released last year. The charges of this task group were to review surface guided image, surface guided imaging and radiotherapy, and to look at the current use and commercial available systems, as well as to summarize commissioning and ongoing QA requirements. They looked at recommendations for use of patient positioning, as well as the deep inspiration breath hold and frameless 
brain SRS treatment. I'll talk more about that throughout this treatment or throughout uh, this presentation. Uh, and then finally, they, this task group also mentions um, emerging clinical applications of surface imaging. Uh, but first, I um, wanted to mention these commercially available systems. These are really the three main systems that you hear about. There's the CRAD system, Vision RT, and Varian Identify system. So they are all very similar. They typically use one to three cameras that are mounted on the ceiling of a treatment room. And they are spaced either at 90 degrees apart or 120 degrees apart. This really depends on the space in the treatment room. Uh, it depends if this is, if you want to use the imaging system in a photon center versus a proton center. Um, there's a lot more thought that goes into the placement of where to place the cameras on the ceiling. Um, they use the op, so I mentioned earlier that one of the vendors uses a structured light. So there's two different optical technologies that are mentioned in the TG302. It mentions that the CRAD system uses a structured light imaging system, whereas the Align RT and Identify system uses stereo vision, which uses a speckled pattern. And I will again talk more about that or show some images in the next few slides. Uh, they all generally have pretty large fields of view. I'm most familiar with the CRAD system and um, in the past, uh, my interest has been using this system or to be able to use a system for pediatric patients in the future, because it does have a really large field of view and you could potentially track the entire motion of a pediatric patient um, with the field of view that, um, that it has. Um, what's also really great is the positioning accuracy for these systems uh, has shown to be below one millimeter and one degree. And they use slightly different registration algorithms. So first here is the CRAD Catalyst HD system. This was at my old clinic when uh, I was in grad school in San Antonio, Texas. The CRAD system uses typically one to three cameras and again projects that structured light. It uses a near invisible violet light. And that's what you can see projected in the center image. I have a phantom set up on the table um, and there's lines being projected onto that phantom. And that is the structured uh, violet light that is being projected onto the treatment table. Um, and so on the left, we have on the left image, that is the image of what the scanner or the camera system looks like. And on the right side, you can see that there are three of those scanners mounted on the ceiling above the treatment table um, in that treatment room. So more on the structured light technology. Uh, this is, just, again, specifically what the CRAD Catalyst HD system uses. And um, to recall what I had said before, a known light pattern is projected onto a patient surface. Um, so in these top pictures, we have the objects that are the hands, structured light is projected onto that, and then we, are, we have a reconstructed live image. So these cameras are able to reconstruct uh, coordinates of each pixel based on what is projected. Um, and then I really love these images on the bottom. They show a great representation of how the registration algorithm um, calculates kind of these discrepancies between the live and reference image. So starting with the live image on the bottom left, what the, what the registration algorithm does is it denotes the live image into 
a deformable node graph of calculation points. So this node graph of calculation points is overlaid with the reference image. And again, that reference image is our patient and treatment position. And the way in which the algorithm works is there's first an initial alignment of that live image and the reference image. And then there's a final registration um, that happens where the shifts are generated telling between these live and reference images. <laughs> the next commercial system is the AlignRT system, also previously called OSMS, Optical Surface Monitoring System. This is by VisionRT. And it also uses uh, one to three camera pods. Um, but rather than using structure sight, it uses a speckled red light pattern onto the patient surface. So this image on the left is a white square phantom that is placed on the table and they showed an example of what that light looks like on um, that phantom. And in the right top image, again, it's similar to the technology with CRAD. There are three cameras mounted to the ceiling of the treatment room above the linear accelerator. <laughs> okay. And here's our third commercially available system called the Varian Identify System. There are three cameras that project a blue LED light onto the patient. And um, so this system, I haven't worked with this one yet, but um, we just got the ETHO system here at the University of Washington and they're going to be adding in this variant identify system. So I'll soon be able to learn more about this. Um, but the display, um, this is kind of, I threw on this image, this is kind of what this, the display will look like when you're monitoring the motion of a patient. Um, and as well, the bottom image shows uh, the example of what the camera scanner looks like. So the variant identify system and the line RT system are slightly different than the CRAD system I mentioned earlier and how the optical technology works. And something that's unique about it is that they actually have two image sensors and one projector, whereas the CRAD system has one projector and one image sensor. So they actually use a stereo vision technology. And this is similar to the idea of the Brain Lab exact track system, if you've heard of that. It actually uses stereoscopic x-ray images. So that means they're taking images at different angles and they're able to reconstruct um, coordinates um, of an image based on uh, stereoscopic imaging. So again, these systems have, you can see in the top picture, that camera again, there's two sensors, one projector. I really like um, the example that I've previously heard about this is it's kind of how our two eyes work. So that's why there's a picture um, of a person there, there the stereogram viewer. And so these cameras use, again, a single projector and they produce a dull image um, or image pairs. And these are used to recreate the impression of a 3D object. And because we know the distance between the image sensors um, this produces a disparity of the images and allows us to um, reproduce um, a 3D image um, of an object. So, all right, so next I want to get into why would we want to use surface guided imaging. So these are some of the main reasons. For patient positioning, we can improve interfraction setup accuracy. So interfraction means the time between fractions. We can monitor patient surface or anatomical changes. We can also use it for motion monitoring. So we can monitor interfraction motion. 
they can measure, measure the motion within the fraction. So as the radiation is being delivered, we can know in real time where the patient's position is. We can quantify unwanted movement, and we can use it for gated or respiratory gating um, delivery, for example, for DIBH, which I'll, I'll talk about um, in the future. And yeah, so first, next I'm gonna get into the workflow of its use. So to start, you can break down the radiotherapy workflow into kind of two phases. There is the planning phase and the delivery phase. And in the planning phase, we know there's CT simulation, um, we generate images in which we want to plan our treatment on. We send those to our treatment planning system, we create contours, a whole treatment plan, um, and then we send that to our machine, and then physics performs plan verification. And then there's the second phase, delivery of the treatment. So the patient is set up for treatment and Position verification is performed, and then treatment is delivered. So first, I'm going to talk about the implementation of surface imaging with CT simulation. So the goal of CT simulation is to reproduce setup at CT simulation um, at subsequent fra fractions of treatment. So the goal here is to capture an image that we can um, reproduce the patient with later. Um, and so two ways we can do that is we can use the we can use a surface imaging system that is specifically made to be used in the CT simulation room. So this top image is an example of the CRAD Sentinel system. So this is positioned above the treatment table or the, the couch of the CT simulator. So it's different than the CRAD system that's in the treatment room rather than having three cameras mounted above the treatment machine. Here, there's just a single camera um, above the CT scanner. And that is used to acquire uh, just a frontal image of the patient as they're going in for their CT scan. A second way that we can reproduce, um, get an external image at CT simulation is that we can actually use the CT itself. We can create an external surface contour that you see here in the bottom image. So an external contour, um, which is a green surrounding the, the skin of the patient. And then we can actually transfer that to um, our treatment machine and use that image for setup. Um, okay, so another use of surface imaging in the CT simulation part of the workflow is that it can be used for respiratory motion management. So we can actually use virtual tracking points to monitor patient breathing. And what it's actually doing is it's monitoring amplitude changes of the patient's chest as they're breathing. Specifically, the system that I'm most familiar with, it actually has a primary and secondary uh, tracking point that can be placed on the patient. The primary point is typically recommended to be placed on the patient's chest, actually at the xiphoid process. And then uh, some clinics place a secondary point on the stomach of the patient. And this can tell us if the patient is more of a stomach breather and kind of give us more of an idea of how they are breathing. Um, if we are interested in um, respiratory gating or respiratory motion management. So this information can be really great for 40 CTs and deep inspiration and breath holds. So here's an example of what the display of the system would look like. You would have um, an image of the patient from above and a tracking point would be placed 
um, on their chest. So here there is a red tracking point. And in the figure below, it shows the amplitude of their breathing over time. And in the case of a, a breath hold treatment, we will ask a patient to hold their breath at a deep inspiration. And so they may be wearing goggles like this, or they may have a screen in front of their face. And they'll be asked to hold their breath. And as they're holding their breath, the, their amplitude of their chest will change. And that will correlate with this orange bar um, that they can see on the glasses. And as they take a deep breath, we want them to hold that um, orange bar inside this inside the green box um, that is seen on the glasses. And they're typically asked to hold their breath for about 20 seconds. And so in a six lot of patient education, typically patients are asked to practice holding their breath prior to coming in um, so that them, when they're at CT simulation and when they're at treatment, that, that this can feel a little bit easier. Um, okay. So the next part of the radiotherapy workflow that I wanted to mention for SGRT use is it's mainly used in setup and radiation delivery. So for again, for patient positioning and for uh, motion monitoring. So as I mentioned before, in CT simulation, we want to re re reproduce that patient position that um, was at CT simulation. And we want this for every treatment, whether it's one or 30 treatments. Um, so we can set up with an external reference that's acquired at CT simulation. As I mentioned earlier, this could be an image from the DICOM external contour that was produced in the treatment planning system, or it could be from another SGRT system that is in the CT room. Um, we could also acquire a new external reference image in the treatment room. So we could actually use the cameras. As I mentioned, there, there may be three cameras mounted to the ceiling of the treatment room, and we can use that um, to generate a new reference image. And, but we do this most likely after x-ray image verification is performed because we still use that as our gold standard. So a little more on positioning. Um, some of the systems or specifically the CRAD system since I'm most familiar with the system it can use in-room and on-patient light projections. And this can be really great and useful for therapists when setting up patients. So they can actually project a red light. So for, in this instance, we were setting up um, an extremity. Um, or I just had one of my coworkers um, on the table, we took a reference image. So we said that we wanted um, the hand placed on the table at a certain position. And when I when I moved the table up, the, a red light from the surface imaging system projected and it told us that the arm was placed too high. And then I lowered the table and the yellow light was projected and told us that the arm was placed too low. So these are kind of different, um, just, just very helpful things for the therapist to more quickly set up patients. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to mention, when you learn about surface imaging or if you read any papers, um, this paper is often cited, and this was a paper by Dr. Dennis Stanley, where he showed that there was an increase in setup accuracy for positioning patients with surface imaging. 
um, rather than the three point marker setup. So rather than the three point marker setup with using in room lasers, they looked at over 6,000 infractions. They looked at multiple treatment sites, such as the pelvis, the abdomen, the chest, and the breast. And um, and you can see here, they have the average values for the position shift corrections that they found. Um, and over all treatment sites, there was a shift um, in setup. And so they were comparing the corrections that were made for CBCT. So that means they were either initially set up with lasers and then a CBCT um, was performed and corrections were made, or they were set up with 3D surface imaging and then the CBCT corrections, a CBCT was performed and corrections were made. Um, so we always they always used cone beam CT as their gold standard in this paper. Um, and what this tells us is that SGRT or surface imaging really tells us more information about body posture. And if we're able to reduce um, or set up more accurately with surface imaging, this means we're able to reduce more uncertainty, uncertainty in the setup process, um, which overall reduces risk of error in our setup. So another use of surface imaging is, is increased safety with motion monitoring. It permits us to not only just set up the patient accurately and with increased accuracy, but it also allows us to monitor their motion throughout the duration of a treatment. Um, and this really provides us a lot more information that is typically unaccounted for. Um, and radiotherapy treatments. Um, another great use of being able to monitor motion is that you can set thresholds with the system. So if the patient moves an unsafe amount, we can actually halt the treatment beam completely and stop the delivery. So the next thing I wanted to mention was um, this paper that really demonstrates uh, kind of what surface imaging has been able to teach us. Um, in this study, they looked at 30 free breathing breast patients um, and they looked at 3D surface imaging um, motion over the course of their treatment. So they had 831 monitoring sessions. They looked at the mean, root mean square over all patient shifts that were calculated. Um, and they demonstrated a strong, significant correlation with time. So what this means is that the longer that the patient was on the table, the more likely they were to move. Um, so this is just something really important for um, clinicians to consider is the length of their treatment. And the longer that the patient is on the table, the more likely they're going to shift and be in the incorrect position. Um, and this is not what we want since uh, we, we really want that high accuracy in our radiotherapy treatment, specifically if we are treating an SBRT treatment with one millimeter margin. Okay, the next thing I wanted to mention was surface imaging for respiratory gating. Um, so I mentioned before it can be used for DIBH. So this is deep inspiration breath hole. This was a study where they looked at 13 patients receiving less, left breast radiotherapy um, using this technique. And what happens in this technique is a patient is again told to um, hold a deep inspiration for typically approximately 20 seconds. Um, and as they do this, their lungs are inflated and their breast is pulled away or separated from their heart um, at a greater separation. And this allows us to reduce toxicity to that organ. 
Um, and specifically in this study, they were able to um, measure in these 13 patients the reduction in um, heart to the um, dose to the heart. They saw a reduction of mean heart dose by 52%, by maximum heart dose by 59%, and a reduction of left interior descending artery dose by 75%. Uh, and this is really important in this case because, um, or this has been a really big finding with DIBH because we are able to lower the risk of um, cardiac toxicity toxicity due to radiotherapy treatment. So the next thing I wanted to mention was use of surface imaging for motion monitoring with open face masks. So in the past, uh, positioning a patient for um, a stereotactic radiosurgery treatment maybe primarily with a frame-based treatment where we are drilling multiple screws into the patient's skull. Um, but um, there's also been changes in the way in which we treat patients. And sometimes if we want that high accuracy, we might still use the frame depending on the clinic, or we might use the, frame, the frameless treatment where we use thermoplastic masks. And a lot of these masks um, or initially these masks were enclosed, as you can see with this person on the left side. But over time, or more recently, they're creating open face masks. And this produces increased comfort and less claustrophobia for a lot of patients. Um, but also having this open face mask option allows us to use surface guided imaging to monitor face motion. Um, for treatment. So the next few slides that I wanted to share, I really like these images from um, a AAPM talk in 2020. Um, they really show just, um, they show us motion over time for different patients. Um, that were immobilized in open face masks. So this was a typical patient. This is kind of, these are values that we would desire, that we would want. Um, so on, we have, on the left, we have vector distance over time. And so as this patient was undergoing treatment, their average motion was 0.3 millimeters. And they saw that 90% of the time, their motion was below 0.46 millimeters. And this is very high accuracy. This is what we would want, um, especially for SBRT treatments when we're using one millimeter margins. So in contrast to a typical patient, here is a patient with significant breathing motion. So this was a heavier patient immobilized in an open face mask. Again, we're looking at um, this over time, and um, this patient may have caused more stretching of the mask uh, due to their size, but their average motion was 0.27 millimeters, and 90% of the time they're below 0.52 millimeters, which um, just is also really high accuracy below one millimeter. And also with this data, they were able to also complete a Fourier transform that was able to um, tell them the frequency of this person's respiratory cycle, which was really interesting. So this is a final um, um, figure for the open face masks in motion that I wanted to share that was interesting. It really showed um, kind of the contrast between high accuracy versus what the surface imaging can tell us. As I mentioned before, it tells us a lot more information that maybe we may have not accounted for in the past. So this was a patient with significant back pain, and the clinicians uh, were notified 
that there was an issue um, due to the surface imaging cameras. As you can see, there was um, a very large shift and uh, the, the patient's average motion was 1.68 and 90% of the time below 2.79 millimeters. But there was this very large shift um, due to the patient shifting because they were in pain. Uh, so what happened was um, the tumor, the contour for the tumor, um, or the margins were increased to account for more uncertainty in delivery. And then the patient was given pain medication so that they could more easily relax on the table. And motion was decreased to below one millimeter. So this is uh, something that uh, the clinicians might have not otherwise noticed if it weren't for surface imaging, they wouldn't have been able to notice a couple millimeter shift because a lot of uh, treatment rooms have in-room cameras that show us the patient on the table, but they don't always, but surface imaging goes a step farther and gives us millimeter accuracy of our patient positioning. So um, the next thing I wanted to mention was additional benefits of surface imaging. It can be used for increased patient safety. So it can tell us um, the position of the patient, not only before treatment, but throughout the duration of the treatment. Um, we can reduce body position uncertainty. We can identify surface or anatomical changes. It can, it can be used uh, potentially to tell us about breast swelling uh, and if a treatment should be adapted based on that breast swelling. It can decrease treatment margins and a lot of clinics have become ta tattoo -less with surface imaging. So we haven't even had to tattoo patients, which is been really great um, because this can be very psychological, um, psychologically difficult for patients for them to have to see their tattoos for years after their cancer treatment. Just to name a few limitations of this technology, they do have a finite field of view. The registration accuracy limitations, uh, which could manifest. Um, are due to the target to surface displacement. And so this means that the tracking algorithm may work best if the target or the tumors are closer to, are more superficial. So it might not be, it may not be as accurate if there are deep seated tumors. And when real time surface imaging is significantly deformed or the real-time surface of the patient um, is more deformable. Uh, there may be issues with the surface imaging system. So rather than tracking the face, an open face mask, which is a more rigid structure, you might have more trouble um, using the system for more deformable um, treatment sites, such as the breast. Um, and I just wanted to mention a few things that I have researched in this area, and then I'm going to get into some case studies. But a lot of my work has been looking at the limitations and accuracy of surface guided imaging and radiation therapy. For example, one of my studies was looking at face motion and um, what would happen if a, face, if a patient was mobilized in an open face mask for their head or neck treatment, um, and they were to express emotional response or to crease their forehead. We wanted to understand how would the system respond. Um, and we believe that there can be false positional corrections that are produced. And we kind of recommend that therapists have patients remain um, or educate their patients to remain uh, calm on the treatment table with their eyes closed when using open face masks. And um, I've also looked at the end-to-end -end 
accuracy comparing surface imaging to x-ray imaging for SRS treatment. And this was in phantom, and it showed very high correlation between using a stereotactic x-ray system um, with a surface imaging system. And what I'm currently working on right now, I'm trying to understand the surface imaging use for different skin tones is optimal use. Something really important to think about when using surface imaging is that darker skin tones require more projected light um, because darker tones are more likely to absorb more light. I'm also looking at analyzing different reference surface sizes. So for example, if we're monitoring a breast treatment, so we want to look at should we be monitoring both breasts during treatment or should we just be monitoring a single breast that we are planning to treat? Uh, and then finally, one of my interests is trying to understand how to use this surface imaging system to detect anatomical changes so that we can adapt a treatment if we need to. Okay, so now uh, we're gonna get into some case studies that I find very interesting. So in this first example, SCRT notified clinicians that a wrong immobilization um, was used. So the patient required non-standard immobilization and they were not set up that way, but uh, after a CBC detected a 10 degree pitch error, uh, they corrected the, the, the correct pitch would have been detected if they used surface imaging prior to CBCT imaging. So if they were to initially set up with surface imaging, they could have used their initial reference image to set up a patient and they would have been able to see that there is a large pitch error. But um, because they didn't do that, they took a CBCT of the patient, they saw this large pitch error. So then they went and grabbed the correct immobilization device and this patient had to be re-CBCT'd. So they had to undergo um, additional imaging, which extended the treatment, um, exposed them to more radiation. Um, and so this is just kind of a simple pro problem that could have been addressed with surface imaging um, and would reduce kind of that need for that additional image. Uh, this is a recent publication that was published last year by some of my colleagues and this was a case study uh, for treatment of breast cancer. There was a patient with Huntington's disease. So this woman was diagnosed with node positive breast carcinoma. The patient, because of her Huntington's disease, like she could not be immobilized for daily radiation therapy treatments because she had a lot of involuntary movements that became more erratic when she became more anxious. And as you can imagine, being on the treatment table for a lot of patients can um, make them a lot more anxious. And so in, in these images that the figure um, on the left, the patient is set up with surface guided imaging. And on the right, this is a snippet from their monitoring report. Um, it shows shortly after the beam turned on at approximately three minutes, there was sudden patient movement. And once the predetermined motion threshold uh, was applied. The motion vector turned, the, turned red and the beam automatically shut off. So as I mentioned previously, the system can be used to apply thresholds. Um, and if we determine the patient moving um, out of an unsafe position, we can halt the treatment completely. Um, so this patient with Huntington's Huntington disease, they used a five millimeter threshold to stop the treatment. Um, and she was able to complete her breast cancer treatment. So this is something that we wouldn't have been able to do without the use of surface imaging. 
Okay, the next, uh, this is the last case study I wanted to mention. This was a pediatric patient who was treated without anesthesia. This was an 18 month old boy with a relapse Wilms tumor. They were unfit for surgery and anesthesia due to um, a superior vena cava syndrome. So this means that there's a blockage or compression of the superior vena cava. Uh, and their CT simulation, it revealed that there was compression of the trachea, meaning that there was a critical airway um, obstruction. And because of surface imaging, we were able to um, monitor the patient without anesthesia. And this patient was treated with 10 MV photons uh, directed at a large anterior mediastinal mass. So here's two images from their study. Their two sagittal chest CT scans. Um, I've circled the mediastinum mass. And you can see initially there was a large mass. Um, and after treatment, after four weeks after radiation therapy, there was a big decrease in that mass. And you can also see the obstruction of their airway. Um, that's what this arrow is pointing to. So on the left image, um, so you can see the narrowing of their airway. So that's why they weren't able, they were unfit for anesthesia um, and for surgery. But after the medial stinal mass had decreased in size, there is a um, increase um, in the separation there for the airway. So that was a really interesting study and I'm sure um, really exciting for them to be able to share. So in conclusion, surface imaging or surface guided radiation therapy can be used for many treatment sites for brain, breast, head and neck, abdomen and extremities. It can reduce inter and intrafraction, target localization errors and provide us additional information that is typically unaccounted for. It's valuable for positioning, motion management, and it can increase patient safety. And finally, I just want to thank you. Say thank you to some of my mentors over the years, Jurgen Meyer, Carl Rasmussen, and Dennis Stanley. Um, they're also really great physicists who've worked with surface imaging a lot and who have, um, I also stole some of their slides for this presentation. So yeah, thanks so much for the opportunity to speak. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Victoria.